Watch this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Very simple, easy to understand. And to give to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is what? Revealed from where? Heaven with His mighty angels. Notice this, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Now notice verses 8 and 9. On those who do not obey the what? Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to this verse, is it important that we obey the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? Not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. Someone say amen. amen. Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting... What's that word? Destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And so those who are alive and remain of the wicked now, when Jesus returns in His resplendent glory, they are destroyed with the brightness of His coming. I could quote you another text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, but you can just write that down. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, but 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says the same thing. And so we've dealt with three of the four groups. In fact, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, actually, we've dealt with all four, if you just think about it. So, what happens to the righteous living when Jesus returns? Righteous living. They're caught up in, what's that word? Translated. What happens to the righteous dead when Jesus returns? Resurrected. What happens to the wicked living when Jesus returns? Destroyed by the brightness of His coming. And what would happen to the wicked dead? Uh, nothing. They would just stay there. That's exactly right. We'll come back to that in a minute. Incidentally, there's going to be a second resurrection. Who do you think will come up in the second resurrection? Now think about it. If the righteous come up in the first resurrection, who would come up in the second resurrection? The wicked. So there's no point in anything happening to the wicked dead at this point because they're going to stay dead through the 1,000 years and at the close of the 1,000 years, they'll be raised from the dead. If that makes sense, say amen. In fact, let me just show you that very quickly. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, what I'm trying to do here, instead of keeping you in suspense and then sort of saying, aha, drama, aha, drama, I'm just giving you the whole picture right from the Bible so you can see it plain as the noonday sun. Revelation chapter 20, and let's it pick it up in verse 5. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. It says, but the rest of the dead, that would be the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were what? Finished. So there it is. Let's continue on here. And so these are the five events that commence the millennium. The five events that begin the millennium. Number one, the second coming of Christ, which results in the resurrection of the righteous. Number two. Number three, the translation of the living righteous. Number four, the wicked living are what? Slain. And Satan is bound for how long, everyone? One thousand years. So far, so good. See, this is very simple. Now, notice that it says that Satan is bound with a chain. He's bound with a what? Did you see that? I'm reading now in verses 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, Revelation 20, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, and he bound him for 1,000 years. And we're going to ask a very legitimate question here. Is Satan bound with a literal chain? What are these chains that bind Satan? Is it realistic to expect that a spiritual being would be bound with a literal chain? I think the answer is no. What we discover according to the Bible is that Satan is bound with a chain of what? Circumstances. In the same way that I might say, oh, I'd love to have lunch with you. I'd love to be able to come over. I'd love to be able to do such and such. But my hands are tied. Are my hands really tied? No, what I'm saying is, is that circumstances beyond my control are making it difficult for me to work you into my schedule or for you to work me into your schedule. So I say, oh, my hands are tied, but my hands aren't really tied. And so when it says that Satan is bound, it means he's bound by a chain of circumstances. Now think about that for just a moment. Satan's job is to deceive and to destroy human beings. If that makes sense, say amen. Oh, but wait a minute. Where are all the human beings at this point? Well, let's go down our four, four, four groups of people there. Where are the righteous living? Okay, they've been caught up. Where were the uh, righteous dead? Okay, they've been caught up. How about the uh, wicked living? Okay, they've been slain. What about the wicked dead? They've re okay, so where is everyone? Their answer is they're gone at this point. We're going to say, well, where are they gone? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But if no one's around for Satan to deceive and to destroy and to harass, then he would be bound by a chain of circumstances because there's nothing he can do. If that makes sense, say amen. I mean, the idea of binding Satan with a literal rope or a literal chain is not exactly what the uh, revelator had in mind here. So notice Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, describing the second coming. It says, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. This is a horrific scene describing the second coming of Jesus for those who had not put their faith in the Lord. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and what? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And look at this. From the wrath of the... What's that word? Notice it doesn't say the wrath of the lion. 
Uh, gentlemen, I dare say that if you were walking through the woods with your sweet friend, perhaps your wife or maybe just a special friend, and a lamb jumped out on the pathway and you said, ah, and ran cow you know, uh, cowering in the opposite direction, I don't think that things would ever be the same between you and your spouse again. Are we clear on that? <laughs> Notice it says here, from the wrath of the what? The wrath of the lamb. I mean, wh what's going on here? They hadn't put their faith in Jesus as Messiah, and so now when he returns, they're afraid of him. Absolutely amazing. Verse 17, for the great day of his what? Wrath has come. And John the Revelator says, who can stand? The rocks are falling. It's a great cataclysmic, catastrophic, cacophonous event. The rocks are falling everywhere. The Bible says in Peter that the rocks were melting with fervent heat. There's a great earthquake. And the people are literally running to the rocks saying, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Next uh, cha verse here is Isaiah chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. The earth is, what's that word? Violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. This is describing the second coming. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a what? Like a hut. Notice that. Verses 20 and 21. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not. What's the next word? Words. Rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones and the earth, the kings of the earth. And so when Jesus returns, it is a cataclysmic, catastrophic event. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, this was described in many different ways in both the Old and the New Testament. It says a great earthquake or as a mighty thundering. It says that every island and mountain is disappearing. It's going to be an absolutely amazing event. They will be gathered, verse 22 of Isaiah 24, together as prisoners are gathered in the what? Pit. And they will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. This is describing the millennium event. Jesus Christ returns. The earth is put into a state of disrepair. It is utterly shattered and destroyed. The wicked go down into the grave for how many years, everyone? One thousand years. But notice it says, after many days, they will be punished. You're getting it. That's exactly right. And so you should be able to fill all of that in there. Look now at your study guide at the bottom of page one. Study guide, bottom of page one, it says, the Bible describes the earth as being a bottomless pit. A bottomless what, everyone? Pit. This phrase comes from the Greek word abusos. Let's see if we can find that. It's right here. This is the word. The, the Greek word here, when it says that the earth is like a bottomless pit, is that word right there, abusos. And what English word does that sound like? Abyss. That's what you'd write in right there. What English word does this sound like? Abyss. Now, this is very important. Not coincidentally, the word abusos is used to translate the condition of the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You know, Genesis 1, 1, where it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the Septuagint, now the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay? So the Greeks, they translated in the days of Jesus. They didn't always read the Old Testament in Hebrew. They took the Old Testament, which is originally written in Hebrew, and they wrote it in Greek. And when they translated that word, those verses there in Genesis chapter 1, it says the earth was without form and void. They used that word, abusos. The idea is of a great abyss without form and void. And we've given you several texts there at the bottom that corroborate that. Basically, John the Revelator saw this earth absolutely thrashed and trashed after the second coming of Jesus. To him, it looked like a great bottomless pit. Mountains had been laid to waste. Islands had disappeared. There was no man. Total destruction reigned. We've already seen the rocks and the mountains are falling, etc., etc.